Hey, it's time for Tech Talk number 47. Uh, we weren't going to do the fingers anymore. We're running oh, yeah, that's right. Finger. I forgot. That doesn't work anymore. That's right. We're going to actually put a scoreboard up. Number 47. 47. 47. Speaking of scoreboards, the Bills are actually going to make the playoffs this year and may actually win the division. The Eagles? Eh. The <laughs> Patriots? following. Eh. Sorry, guys. Anyway. <laughs> the Bills need a chance. I, yeah, they look the, they look good last night against the Steelers, but and the Rams. Uh, yeah, and the Rams and everybody else for that matter. But we're not talking about football. We're here to talk about voiceover tech. And if you have a question about your home studio, about equipment or technique, or you got a buzz or a hum or something like that, and you want to know more about it. You know, we're the guys to talk about it. So put it in the chat room right now if you're watching on Facebook. And Yes. You needed that right about now, didn't you? I, I did. My ear just loved that. And <laughs> so, so if you got a question, throw it in there because we're going to do Tech Talk right now. Here it is. Voice over body shop, Tech Talk. From, From the, the outer, outer reaches, reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars. A Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master. A professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, making the complex simple, debunking the myths of what it takes to create great sounding audio, answering your questions, showing you the latest and greatest in VO tech, and having a dandy time doing it. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Well, hi there. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO. B S Tech Talk 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 Not Tick Talk Anyway Not to be confused Yes we Yeah we got a lot of cool stuff to talk about tonight And by the way this is our last show of 2020 Thank God Get out of this year This has been my goodness I mean how have we survived this year I mean, actually, we've survived because everybody needed a home studio. Yeah, if you're saying, if you're talking about we, meaning you and me, it's, yes, it's yeah, you and you and me, been a good year for business. Yeah, um, but by surviving by sheer will for a lot of us. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, now with this, you know, this surge, it's like you know, I mean, I haven't gotten sick. I hardly know anybody that's gotten sick. I mean, yeah, here and there, but man, in some places, it is really bad. Yeah. So, uh, you know, our best to everybody who's recovering and the rest of you, wear a mask, wash your hands. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, anyway, because of this pandemic, everybody's got to have a home studio. Everybody. And the thing is, is we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about, uh, you know, what's going to go on in 2021. If you're going to have a home voiceover studio, you got to do it right. And the fact is, is where do you get the right information? Well, George and I have the answer to that. And that is, I mean, talk to one of us. We know what we're doing. We know what it's supposed to sound like. Whistle. 
And I think that's probably one of the issues that most people don't get. They, they, they hear stuff on the radio or they hear stuff on TV or they see stuff on YouTube and they don't have the right idea of really what it's supposed to sound like. But because George and I have been doing this so long and we know what it's supposed to sound like, we know how to get you there, right? That's right. That's what we do. I do it over at georgethe.tech. Um, if you want help with your studio stuff, um, georgethe.tech is the domain. A new website's coming in 2021. <sighs> yes. Thanks to my friends over at the voiceactingwebsites.com. They're building furiously. Karen is burning the midnight oil, literally. Even the oil they don't have. It's a tonic, I get it. Uh -huh. It's got to last for eight days. And <laughs> it's it's, right. for her, it's lasted like all of 2020. And she has, yeah. And uh, But um, that site will be up soon. But um, in the meantime, you can still book services and get sound checks and, and all that kind of thing over at georgethe.tech. And if you want to work with Dan, head over to homevoiceoverstudio.com. Homevoiceoverstudio.com, where I have the Specimen Collection Cup, which... I earlier this year, it, my cup was running runneth over. It was uh, everybody was like, "Does it sound okay?" A lot of times it does, but I will give you a very thorough analysis if you go over to my website, scroll to the bottom of the page, go to the specimen collection cup, click on the specimen collection cup. It will open a Dropbox, and there are specific instructions. I want to hear your raw audio. I think that's a problem that a lot of people have is that they're like, well, I got to use all this technology. I got to use uh, this compressor. And I, gotta... I want it raw because we want to start from a, a, a ground base of which to build. And if you get it right up front, there's really not a whole lot you have to do on the back end. So I want to hear your raw audio and see where it is we need to make physical changes to get your audio sounding right. So uh, $25 audio al analysis Use the specimen collection cup. All righty. Again, the end of plug -a But by the way, this is why we do this show. This was the whole point 10 years ago when it was like, hey, let's do a show. It was all about presenting what you and I do, which is this very, this really narrow niche of home voiceover studios. Not everybody does this. So we decided to do it. And like they always said, who's going to want to watch a show about home voiceover studios? Ten years later, we're still <laughs> doing it. So clearly there is a need. Anyway, Mr. Whitham, you you delve into the Internet. You, you're you there constantly and probably more than usual because you're at home. Uh, and you dig up all the interesting tech things from the voiceover world. And what do you have for us this week? Well, I won't dwell on the MacBook Air M1 because, you know. Oh, go on, please. We're not supposed it's... to be using these yet. They're too new. <laughs> Don't go buy this incredible piece of high-value, quiet, easy-to-use, reliable technology. Don't do it. Why would you want to do that? That's what they're expecting us to do. That's the problem. No, it's it's um, the MacBook Pro M1 is is proven now through a month now of testing by a lot of the YouTubers that I watch and myself included, of just trying different apps to see what runs and what doesn't. Overall, it's been pretty good, but it is still early days because there's not a lot of native support for the M1 machines. There it is right there. And Meaning look how what? quickly... Meaning native quickly support. What do you mean by that? Native support meaning like, so what happens is when you run software on a new Silicon Mac, um, it has to be translated from its native uh, compiled language or whatever. I, I know enough to sound like I know what I'm talking about, but I don't really. <laughs> it's, the software that, was, that runs on these is written for an Intel processor. And so the, the processor uses a certain way of operating and the language has to be written to run on said processor. And Silicon has a different architecture. Maybe that's the right word. And so software that was not written to run natively on the silicon processors or chipset need to be translated. So Apple has written this thing called Rosetta that does that for you. And so far it's done it very, very well. I've, I've tried a few of the popular recording softwares that we do use on Mac um, that I thought would work. And the ones that I've tried so far have Twisted Wave, Audacity, Audition, and Reaper. 
Those four I have definitely tested on the M1 Mac. That, of course, is also running Big Sur. So those are two big variables, right? It has to run not only on Big Sur, but it has to be able to support the Silicon Mac, and that stuff has worked. I've also tested a few pieces of hardware, audio gear, because that's also a big deal. Can, can the computer and Big Sur support your interfaces? And a few that I tested because I had the best guess that they would work um, certainly have. I, the very first one I tested because it was handy and just because it's really awesome it was the MicPort Pro 2. Um, that worked without a hitch. Um, then I tested out, what else did I test? Um, a Rode AI-1. Um, again, worked without a hitch. I surmise that any interface that uses the, what do we call it, plug and play or yeah. the mm -hmm. USB class compliant, whatever that is. Same thing. Anything that, yeah, just <laughs> doesn't require in a special console. Talking about you, uh, Apollo. Um, anything that doesn't require special drivers and, and a console and all this other stuff to operate works, seems to be working beautifully. Um, Sean Daly, a friend of our show and great guy, voice actor in the biz who loves the technology, he's gotten himself, uh, I think, an M1 MacBook Pro and an M1 Mac Mini. <laughs> he's because crazy. He can. Um, <laughs> yeah, and but he loves the tech, and he's been hammering on those too, and he's had pretty good success. I think he's also using RX, uh, RX eight, on the the new Mac M one system. So it is supporting a lot of things, but just keep in mind if you reach out for support from a lot of these companies and the audio interface support teams, and you say I'm on an M one Mac with Big Sur, they're going to go, "Well, well, good luck to you," because we haven't <laughs> we haven't approved our software for that. Um, so I think, uh, uh, Apogee, uh, the Apogee stuff is official for Big Sur and, um, Twisted Wave has been working pretty much since day one on Big Sur. So it's, it's been a good experience, but not flawless. And so it's not, it's still a little bit early, yeah. how but long I'm telling should, you, yeah, yeah. how long should people wait before they delve into that then? Oh, man, it's, this is tough. So, you know. I'm always that guy saying, don't buy the newest, newest thing from Apple. Don't buy generation one stuff from Apple because you're basically testing something that they've just, you know, basically finished developing. That's kind of, that's definitely true for the, the operating system. It's always a little wonky in the first few iterations, you know, the first few updates. Hardware wise though, this is kind of interesting because the chip or what's called the SOC the system on a chip that's basically the entire computer other than the keyboard and screen um, and the battery. Um, that's something that's been in use in one form or another in iPhones and iPads for like 10 years. So they, they've gotten really good at that. And so that's not, I'm not so worried about it being unreliable. And so far, a lot, I've watched a lot of content on this machine and it's proven to be stable and reliable. So I'm not so worried about that. It's just, making sure that you're going to not have any gotchas in the middle of your work day or at the point where you need to deliver a file. Oh, I never thought that that website wouldn't support the new version of Safari or whatever it is, you know? Yeah. So to answer your question directly, at least three months, I think is pretty safe. And by then a lot of us, you know, people that are, that are crazy or did decide to buy a new one, will have had ch chances to try it out. And if you want to be in a conversation about, all of this stuff, definitely join the Facebook group called Mac and iOS for VO. Um, it's about 500 people in there. And in it's there. Uh, without me, you'd be 499. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a good place to talk about all things new app. Well, anything Mac or Apple related, but especially it's, it's where the conversation's happening about what works on these new computers. Going in another direction. So I mentioned Apogee. Yeah. We've 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 all tried and used, and some of us really love the Apogee uh, mic, and um, have had good 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 results with it. And we know it has pros and cons. It's extremely tiny. Um, not, that could be good or bad. <laughs> not very forgiving with plosives. You got to use it. Definitely right? not. Easy to pop. Um, it's kind of got tiny little fiddly buttons and knobs on the unit, which make it a little harder to use. But it works. Now, here's what surprised me. Um, I got to do a, a booth remodel, actually a booth move for Lori Allen 
and I'll, I'll I'll try to share some sound samples of her yeah. of her studio. Yeah. Now, now Lori um, had this very very narrow little studio, as I recall. She really did. Had to go into it sideways. And... It was comically small. If you want to see pictures of of her new booth and one of me standing in the old booth after I tore everything out because I was I forgot to take a before photo. Um, my uh, I have it on Instagram, George the Tech, one word on Instagram. Um, but it's it's uh, it was very tiny and it worked fine because mostly what she was doing at home was quick auditions, maybe a promo spot or something for a Hallmark channel or whatever. She was doing mostly short things. Now, <laughs> the shows like the Spon Sp like SpongeBob SquarePants want to go back into production, you know, and they're like, well, it's time we need to get back to work. And so they shipped out kits to all of the actors. So they all have the same computer, the same software, and the same mic. And the mic they sent out was the Apogee Hype mic, the really? newest iteration of the Apogee mic. Hmm. So it's kind of hard to believe, and you can't, you can't buy promotion like this, but there you go, Apogee. SpongeBob is being recorded on USB mics. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't write it. I was kind of trying to parse, like she's got a 416 and you know, she's got good gear in here. This is the mic they wanted to use. And it started, I put the pieces together and I realized there's a couple reasons for it. One, it can guarantee some level of consistency from actor to actor. And two, they can control it remotely. That's one thing that's kind of cool about the hype mic, right? It has, it's, it's a digitally controlled mic. You control the gain and stuff from inside a little app that runs on the computer. And what they're doing for that show, and this is happening more and more now, is the show is being remotely engineered. And I think this is awesome. Is. And I think this is the way things should be going. And this is something I'd like to talk about later about predictions for 2021, mm -hmm. is that more and more voice work will be remote engineered, not just remote source connect recorded, but fully remote engineered, where Somebody the actor, the, the the levels and and the EQ and all that stuff, the actor just makes sure the system is up and running, and the rest is out of their hands. And so, with the Nickelodeon setup, they've got a MacBook Pro running. I think it's TeamViewer, can't remember. And so they they can do it. They can as soon as she turns on the machine and logs in, they're in there, and they uh, launch the software they're going to use. I believe it's GarageBand, which I'm kind of scratching my head on why they chose that. I'd love to talk to the engineers as to why they're using GarageBand, but that's what they're using. And um, they're just recording her far. They're recording her on the computer and they're remote engineering it while she's listening. I think they're listening to her on Zoom. I think that's what it is. And so it's kind of odd, but kind this is, you know. Diluted there. Yeah, every production is coming up with their own solutions and workflows as to how they want to work. And this is what they seem to be found has worked for them. So now, so the engineer, you don't have to worry, am I clipping? Am I overdriving? Whatever. The engineer can just buy remote, pot down the mic, turn down the gain a little bit as necessary. And it's, it's the wave of the future, I think. Really, I think it is. I, I for a long time, have thought that this would be not only a brain, a no brainer for actors. So they really can act and not think about the technology, but also so that engineers could continue having careers because, oh man, there's just so much less work for the audio engineers now because we're working from home. Right. So this seems to be a perfect marriage. Good. You know, I'm really excited about that. So yeah, bottom line is USB mic. They, I mean, we know that they can be good. Well, especially for, the ep the Epigee USB mics, they they they've mastered yeah. the an interface inside a microphone to where it's indistinguishable from some other mics. And in in fact, if you get the MK4 digital, the Sennheiser USB mic, it's sort of like the grown up Apogee mic. It's the Apogee on the inside, and it's the sure. Oh, I'm sorry, the Sennheiser capsule on the outside. Yes, so, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, so anyway, I thought it'd be f kind of fun to, because what we did was move studios for Lori. We tried to do this just in like one afternoon, so it wasn't too disruptive. But what I tried to pull off was moving everything, gear and the acoustical treatment from a room that's 
roughly a foot and a half wide, five feet long, and seven feet high, <laughs> to a room that's at least twice that in dimensions. So it's maybe about the same width, but it's twice as deep, and it's got a taller ceiling. And um, we just, I just literally just relocated all of the paneling and tried to rearrange everything and see if we could get away with it. And the sound was good, but the real test was if I had Lori record something in the old booth and the new booth, which through the miracle of time travel, we could do. I just had her pull up something from her old booth and then had her re think, and she did this today in the, at the last minute. Thanks, Lori. For the interest, in the interest of science, um, I had her re-record the same exact script, her, sand, her same signal chain, the 416, and into the computer. And well, this is, the, so here are the two recordings. It's, let's see if you, Dan, I know you've heard this already, so I know you're cheating here, but this time. Yeah. let's pretend. Let's, let's see if you can figure out which was the old booth signal chain, the and which was the new booth. And let me pot down whatever's playing back audio right now, because right. that's going to get into the mix and we don't want that. There we go. Okay, so here's sample one. This is one of the studios, and then I'll play the other one. So what were the chances your parents would somehow find each other at that one party your mom didn't even want to go to and have you? And what were the odds their one single roll of the DNA dice would produce not almost you but with freckles or almost you but with a louder laugh, but actual, genuine you? One in 400 trillion. All right. That's Studio One, and here's Studio Two. So what were the chances your parents would somehow find each other at that one party your mom didn't even want to go to and have you? And what were the odds their one single roll of the DNA dice would produce not almost you but with freckles or almost you but with a louder laugh, but actual, genuine you? Hmm. There we go. So those are the two rooms. So Lori did a good job of being pretty consistent with mic placement. I level matched them as to minus 20 RMS in Twisted Wave so they could be as close to as similar as possible. What are you hearing, Dan? What do you what do you hear between those two recordings? Um what what I heard, I mean it's I mean the difference is is totally subtle. And it's subtle, right? It's right. pretty subtle. And the fact of the matter is is those subtle differences would make no difference to somebody who was taking that audio on the other end. Is yeah. that it was clear, it was crisp, it was properly Low noise, recorded, that there's no, no background distortion. No, no distortion at all. Uh they sounded very crisp and you know one had the slight feel of a slightly larger room but that's okay and uh and and so whatever you did it wouldn't make any difference i think this is the the question is it's not splitting gonna, hairs right it's not going to make any <laughs> difference whether she books work or not she's she yeah. is who she is and the audio quality was excellent on both so right so i mean if you heard them in a vacuum it was like if you didn't have them against to hear against each other you probably both of them are fine, fine. right i mean absolutely so yeah so so I'm seeing one comment in the room that Jay Horace says, Studio 2 sounds like she is closer to the mic, she more present. And that might be true, actually. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to make it, I don't want to be too hard on her and say, take a selfie. I want to see exactly how from the, from, from the mic you are. But Studio 2 is, is the small studio, the really small studio. So she's in a really tight, tight space. And um, that has an acoustical effect. And it also means that she could physically be closer to the mic. She can't physically move very far away from it. Whereas Studio One, the first sample, is the new space, which is more larger in volume. It's got to be at least twice, probably three times volumetrically bigger. And what's bizarre, what's, what's really interesting is that I'm using the exact same acoustical paneling, save for a couple of squares of one inch acoustical foam that she had from this little portable folding thing, you know, we just repurposed it. That was it. It's the same panels just redistributed, which is an interesting challenge is like, okay, we're going to move the panels to the new room. Well, it doesn't, not the same size, the height's different, everything's different, but we got something out of it that works pretty well. If I'm going to be really a stickler about it, I might add some more paneling to control a little bit of mid range, but it's, it's pretty dang close. So, you know, that was fun. And I'm glad that she was game to send us, send us those samples because 
it's so rare. In fact, I can't really think of too many examples ever where I've gotten to have two rooms and have everything be exactly the same except the size. So right. that was cool. Yeah. I, so it's, it's interesting that the size of the room really isn't that much of a factor if you treat it right. And the right. fact that, and, and as I recall from that booth, everything was covered. And here you have some more open space. That's uh, right. Between towels. And I remember Bo Weaver telling us once about, yeah, I'd like having a brick wall behind me so it doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, so my, the, all the energy isn't sucked out of my voice by all this sound absorbing material. And so I think it worked probably pretty well. And I think giving her the room to actually breathe is probably kind of helpful too. Can you imagine her doing Pearl the Whale? In her old little booth like this, like where she can't move? No no room to gesticulate at all. Of course, Pearl had little tiny arms as a whale. But true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Oh, my God. So that was really cool. So anyway, that's that's it for my tech update. But let's have a little talk about maybe, as I alluded to, 2021 predictions. Do we have some theme music? It's time for... 2021 20, 20, predictions. 21, 21, 21. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't the sample I wanted. I wanted this one. I've used that one before. It's... 21 predictions. Okay, right. let's do it. Let's get it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first thing I have on this bullet list, and Dan, feel free to I will. interject. <laughs> Add some more to this. I just came up with this, but I know you guys who are Windows users, I got to just shake your head and think we're a bunch of Apple ma so and so's. But I think in 2021, Mac computer sales are really going to go up and increase, and and Windows based system sales are going to start lagging behind. Maybe not at the really budget end, because you know there's a lot of people that just need a basic computer and they cannot uh, they can't get up to that thousand dollar apple threshold well six hundred ninety nine dollar threshold for a mac mini yeah, absolutely um but you know maybe for them that that's not going to be a factor but man for that seven hundred dollar point of entry there there's just absolutely nothing that compares from the windows side custom made handmade made out of parts from a yard sale that no, it's just nothing <laughs> that's going to touch what this computer is going to be going to can do. And it's just going to get better at a very rapid clip. And this is because of the architecture, what Apple has invented and designed and built in house and their chips. Um, it's just remarkable. And, uh, Intel is Intel and AMD. AMD is starting to do better than, than Intel with the PCs. They have their Ryzen chips and, they're really pretty impressive, but uh, boy, I think I think there's going to be more people really thinking about making that switch from the Windows platform. A lot of what people are, people are very fearful if they've been PC of the unknown. Yeah, it's like oh, I, I don't like it. I tried it, I didn't understand it because you used it for five minutes. When you use a Mac, it learns how you work. It really is a very intuitive machine, and you have to get used to it. And once it is, once you really get used to the process and how a Mac works, it's like, why did I ever do anything else? Plus, as, I was there 15 years ago uh, in that exact spot. As, same here. Absolutely. Uh, you know, somebody at Banjo Emporium said, hey, you ever try a Mac? I'm like, no. So I bought a Mac and I've never gone back. It's It's been rock solid. I've had literally no major issues. I've never. Now, granted, when I give my computers to my kids and they spill a Coke on it, it <laughs> you know, things are going to happen. But uh, in my production work, in the work that I've had, Mac Minis and MacBook Pros and Airs, they have been rock solid. If you take care of them, if you know how to do the maintenance on them, and the maintenance on a Mac is much easier because it's easier to, if something, if something stalls or gets, you know, if you, it's easy to get out of it. And it generally, it generally is going to save you when perhaps a PC will just the smoke will start to come out of it and that sort of thing. And so I've always been, I've always been a Mac person really since I started doing voiceover work, the core audio in a Mac just works better. Yeah. I mean, I came from building PCs and 
doing some light gaming. I was never really hardcore, but I did play, did a lot of remote gaming or internet land gaming. And so when I moved to LA in 2004, I was still running PCs and doing everything I needed to do in PCs. I think I still even had a rack mounted PC that I'd custom built, but my clients out here were on Mac mostly. And so I was really forced to adapt. I really had to get up to speed. I bought a Mac mini and after about six months and then installing virtual machines so I could run windows because I did still have to run a couple of things that are windows only, you know, for support, QuickBooks, things like that. Um, I, that, that was it. You know, I was able to finally let go of the, of the PC and, uh, it's been good ever since, yeah. but what if you still want to run windows for whatever reason? Well, you can, and, can't you? Well, you can run windows now. If, well, actually the next thing is windows VD. Yes. WVD. Terrible name. <laughs> it means, like that is one crappy name. <laughs> Who came up with that? <laughs> windows virtual desktop. Um, yeah. Not a good name, but Windows Virtual Desktop essentially means, imagine if your Windows was Netflix. What do I mean by that? <laughs> you could pay 10 bucks a month and have Windows on anything. That could be on your uh, on your Roku. It could, not that you'd want to, but it could be on a Roku. It could be on a, on a phone or an iOS tablet or anything because you're basically streaming a Windows server in the cloud somewhere in the world and it's your computer. It's just virtual. And that's something that's coming on the horizon. It's going to be happening. And so in the one way, you know, it's really interesting because Mac is going, you know, super amazing, powerful computer chips, next level performance, all this. And Windows is saying, mm, we don't have hardware. We can't, we don't have that advantage, but we do have Azure. We do have cloud. We do have that capability. And that's what's going to be happening. How's that going to help you as a voice actor? I have no idea. I really don't. I, I can say that it would be helpful for me for if I have to, again, run specifically Windows apps for very unique situations. Um, it'd be kind of nice. I wouldn't have to have and deal with a virtual machine thing anymore. Maybe for still running QuickBooks um, when I want it to be the same version my accountant, accountant is on on Windows. That could be nice. There are situations, but I don't know how helpful it's going to be for our world. But I think it's coming. We shall see. I mean, now, now that tells me that perhaps now maybe my wife will get a Mac because she can still run her Windows programs on that Mac, which yeah. might might be a good solution to that problem. Because yeah, I mean, I I don't know how to run this. It's like, multi-track recording production over the cloud. <laughs> No, nah, yeah, the latency, everything, maybe not, not for a while, but yes, spreadsheets, uh, Microsoft, Microsoft Office, all that stuff for sure. Um, I know we're running long. I'm sorry. No, we're doing fine. Yeah. We're doing yeah. fine. Um, virtualization of mics is going to just get cheaper and more accessible. Meaning, you're, I think you're going to maybe not next year, but in the next two years, probably get a USB mic that internally can sound like a lot of really expensive microphones. Um, it's happening using things like the Apollo and the Townsend Labs Sphere L22. Cost of barrier of entry, battery to entry is about two grand. Um, there are some others, I think, um, let me think if I can think of the company name. Antelope Audio, I think, is oh, yes. tr trying to get into that world with the edge microphones. So. The price is becoming more accessible. It's coming down, but I think in the next year or two, it's going to become really mainstream. And uh, that's going to be interesting. And how's that going to change your life? I don't really know. But for those that are like, I really want a 416, but I want it to be $300. <laughs> then, you know, yeah. that might happen. Yeah. So get, get a really old used one for 300. And if you can find one for 300. Yeah. yeah. I, see, I, I tend to think that People tend to obsess about microphones way too much in voice. Of course. <laughs> that the, 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 the environment in which you record is so much more important. You don't want to sure. have a lousy mic. And it's easy to find a lousy mic because I'm getting a lot of people who are saying, I got this one on Facebook uh, with some weird Chi name from some Chinese company. And it's a USB mic for 45 bucks. And it's, it's just like... 
Well, yes, this is not a proper micro. Essentially, what it is is a Radio Shack Electret condenser microphone shoved into a tube microphone, and it's oh yeah, it's a studio condenser mic. Yeah, it's inside not- that grill is hidden a ten cent microphone capsule. <laughs> exactly. You know, inside of a body of a mic, and it looks impressive. You know. Yeah. yeah. So unless you've got one of those, generally any good studio condenser mic over one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars is going to be just fine. That's right. That's right. So that I, I, the last one on the bullet list, I really actually already talked about, and that is remotely engineered voiceover sessions, I think will become a lot more of the norm, at least in the part of the voiceover production world where there actually are engineers involved. Right. Because we know that a lot of them, there are not. You know, a lot of that stuff you guys are doing, you have to send it in finished. But um, for the rest of the world where there actually are engineers involved, there'll be more of it will be remote engineered so that you and act, as an actor don't really have to do anything, even worry about mic gain and recording levels. I think that's going to become more uh, mainstream. Yeah, that, so that's it. That's, that's a very that's niche my thing. Then. Yeah, but that's a very I know niche it's niche. Thing. You know, it is. It really is a niche thing. Yeah, because you know, uh, especially here in you know in Hollywood in L.A., where you have a lot of actors. You know, we had we were talking about this last week with with uh, with Everett Oliver. Uh, the fact is, is you've got a lot of people who were not in voiceover who are now in voiceover because all the studios shut down and they're finding, oh, this is really cool. But because they were doing remote sessions uh, and had no idea what they're doing, as you and I found out, it's like I, I, I have to do voiceover, but I don't know what I'm doing. And it's like, OK, put microphone here. Make sure acoustics are right. They'll take care of it. It's it's a very niche thing. I don't think it's something that. I think our general mainstream voiceover yeah. audience has to worry about yeah. until they do. Right. Well, I mean, my hope is that if you get to that echelon of voiceover, it will be a, it'll be easier now as an actor. Yeah. To still be working from home, but have the feeling of being engineered by somebody else. So that's my hope All right. for sure. Great. All, All right. righty. That's, that's our it. predictions for 2021. 21. Get that music back on. What'd you think? We'll be right back after these messages with your questions on VoiceOver Body Shop, Tech Talk. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop. It's a place where you can get your body shopped with voices. Come on. Look at Dan's head. So shiny. In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. Voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on The VoiceOver Body Shop. All right, it's time to talk about Source Elements and what a year it has been for Source Elements and their Source Connect software. In fact, they've, they've been really innovating and trying to find new solutions to serve the remote production world because it's all being done remote almost entirely. So if you want to see what they're up to, you should definitely take a visit at source-elements.com and see the new face of Source Elements, a whole new color scheme, a whole new graphic design, a new site, and uh, see what they're up to over there. But really the thing that you're still, as a voice actor, going to be expected to have to audition for all those big buck gigs is Source Connect. And uh, the good news is you don't have to now buy into a subscription or even buy the license outright, you can now also do just two day licenses. You can get a, just a day play license for a smaller amount of money. And so if you're not ready to commit or you really feel like that gig you're going to get is a one shot deal, 
you can do that, which is kind of cool. So if you want to be up to speed with what is really being used in the big studios these days, the fact that Pro Tools is still king and the fact that Source Connect works as a plugin natively for Pro Tools, Source Connect is the way to go. And, and yes, no, you, <laughs> I said the Pro Tools word, you don't need to have Pro Tools, believe me. It just runs as a standalone app. Um, but get yourself up and running, be ready to go. And uh, if you have any trouble, let us know. I do support for Source Connect for people that need one-on-one -on -one hands-on support at georgethe.tech slash SC. Thanks again, and we'll be right back to answer a slew of questions right after this. This is Ariana Ratner, and you're listening to VoiceOver Body Shop, VOBS.TV. And we're back. You know, one of the points I wanted to make about, about you know, Apple products, for example, mm -hmm. as those people who are actually listening to our show right now, as they're watching it, but also listening, our audio for this show is running through a 2011 Mac Mini. My old Mac Mini. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> if that's not proof that those machines last and stay relevant. Exactly. It's not just the audio either. The Zoom the feed yeah. that is being zoomed in from me to the show and our guest is also running on that same Mac Mini. Yep. So what does that mean? It means that they're like they're like cars that last a long time, which is not a lot of cars. But uh, yeah, no, they, it's they, the uh, Saturn of cars. Yeah, that's it. What was it on, well, on, on Car right. Talk? They were saying perhaps General Motors should just change their entire line to name Saturn. Just <laughs> rename the company Saturn. <laughs> and it'll be fine. It'll be fine. So Very everything should be called Apple. Anyway, we got a bunch of questions here from you guys, and we appreciate you sending them in prior to the show, but we also like you sending them in during the show, which you can do in our chat room as Jeff Holman is sitting there typing down your questions and copying them and pasting them into our workbook here, and we can answer the question live. Let's go for this first question from Hillary O'Keefe. George? She says, how do I know the volume of I'm that volume I'm exporting my audio files with is high enough? Hearing me out. Okay. I recently did VO for my company's event site tutorial. While I was recording it, Logic was telling me I was ranging between minus 18 dB and minus 15 dB, which I'm assuming you mean peak, not RMS. Okay. Uh, it sounds plenty loud on my end. Um, I didn't add any gain when I bounced it, and it wasn't until I watched the videos on YouTube that I realized how quiet it sounded. Um, does anyone, does everyone hear minus 18 dB the same? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Probably not. Um, is there a dB range I should shoot for every time, unless directed otherwise? And how can I be sure I'm creating files that aren't too quiet or too loud for the greatest number of people? Oh boy, that is. And here's that's why a it's a problem. She's using an RE20. Can is it, she using an RE20? Well, she'll hard. have a hard time getting really good levels with no that. No question one. about it. And that's when I saw this question, I'm like, oh, well, you're using a dynamic mic. Don't. That's one issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's using that into a Focusrite Scarlet, uh, uh, Focusrite Scarlet Solo. No additional amplification. If you're going to use an RE20, which we don't recommend, you really need to have another preamp into the preamp. Because there's not enough, if the output from an RE20 is so low, you've got to really punch it and you've got to be too close to the mic and it doesn't sound wholly natural. Now, for a narration or something like that, you can probably get away with it. But for this particular thing, there's, it's not loud enough. And uh, she's using Logic Pro X on a 2013 Mac, still working, um, and using a, an audio technique. And the headphones, by the way, have very little to do with what you sound like. On the other end, it's how you're monitoring. End, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's yeah. like, if it's not loud enough, well, because it's not loud enough. You should yeah, be... Yeah, minus 18. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, the concern I have is that she only mentioned minus 18 as a value without the qualifier of, is it peak or is it average? Right. I'm guessing it's probably peak level she's talking about. It if you were averaging minus 18, it would be that would be plenty loud. loud that would be quite loud. And that's that's the average level that we produce things for like broadcast, podcasting, or like audiobooks. Right. Um, and the problem with Logic, because it was not designed around what we do, 
which is mastering voiceover for, you know, voiceover. for video and games, <laughs> yeah. it's, it doesn't, it's not easy. At least I'm not aware of an easy way of getting that information out of logic, getting a quick analysis of the audio and seeing what actually is the average volume. That's super easy to do in Twisted Wave. There's called analysis. Um, it's very, very easy to do. But to really answer the question, once you find a tool that measures average volume or RMS volume, shoot for something around minus 20, minus 23 to minus 20 dB average yeah. RMS level. Yeah. And you are going to be probably fine. But there are no standards. <laughs> That's the problem. Well, actually, there are some standards that have been set by the World Voices uh, Technical Standards Committee. For peak uh, level. For, for peak level. But what we... Yeah, yeah. What I have found, because I generally don't use any of these things, any of these diagnostic mm -hmm. tools, I find that if you are modulating consistently above minus nine and peaking between minus six and minus four, you're going to be fine. And all this mumbo jumbo about, you know, RMS and all these other things, while it's important to engineers, if you do it right up front and get your modulation right up front and give an engineer on the other end, uh, you know, a tabla rosa, a, a, a clean slate of what they need that they can manipulate without distorting the sound or you know, having to give it too much gain. It's going to be fine. So don't overthink this stuff. And just because you see all this stuff about RMS doesn't mean you have to go take a class in audio physics. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a problem with logic. It, it just... It's it, and, it, and you're going to get a spec sometimes that says it's in your levels peaking at minus 18. Yeah. Now, trust me, if you recorded an audition or at a commercial and the levels peak at minus 18, they're going to be like, huh? What? What's going on? I can't hear it's you. It's really, really quiet. It's going to be like much, much too quiet. So, yeah, watch out for that. Yeah, you want to average that, but, you know, because it's going up and down and it's going to cross over somewhere and, but. You want to be mm -hmm. loud up front, but not overmodulated. Mm -hmm. Question from Richard. A couple of queries about mic care. Do we care about mic care? Well, of course. Uh, can changes in temperature and or humidity affect the performance of a condenser mic to any significant degree? I don't think so. It, mm. You know, I mean, some places are more humid than others, but if you're in a really humid place, generally it's air conditioned and the humidity is taken out of the air. If you're here in Southern California, there's no humidity. It's all been burned off. Uh, if you're suffering through recording voiceover, like in a closet in the deep south or the north where it's east or something where it's really humid, it could, I mean, at the extremes, it could help, it could, it could cause issues, but you'll know. I yeah, mean, you'll, you'll hear, hear it, it yeah. immediately in your audio. You'll hear some weird artifacts, noise, something called motorboating, <laughs> where the mic sounds like it's, <laughs> you know, you'll hear some weird stuff happen. The good thing about like a Sennheiser 416 is those mics were designed to handle horrible conditions <laughs> and really, really bad um, humidity. So if you are in one of those places and you're concerned, then use a, a 416 or an NTG5 by Rode because they are pretty much, you know, they can ignore that because they use, oh, I'm going down the rat hole here again, but I think it's called an RF pickup. It's called an RF technology, RF. And that's that system, whatever, is pretty much impervious to uh, condensation and humidity. I think those factors have far more to do on the performance of your voice than they do on the performance of the microphone. Well, yeah, for sure. If you're suffering at those, if you're at those extremes where the mic cares, you're probably at that point absolutely miserable right. <laughs> as an actor. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, you're going to lose a few pounds in those hot places. Anyway, second yeah. part of this question says, what's the best way to store a mic when it's not in use? I leave my road on its studio arm to minimize any handling impact and cover it with a loose fitting plastic bag to keep the dust off. Would it also help? Would it would would it help to also include a couple of silica gel sachets in the bag to counteract any humidity or can they potentially cause damage to the diaphragm by drying out the air too much? Great show. Thanks as always. This guy must live in New Orleans. Uh, Somewhere <laughs> really humid. Really, really, really humid. <laughs> you know, like, you know, the Caribbean somewhere. 
Um, you know, I, I've never even the dust off's not a bad thing. No, I, I mean if you're not going to use it for a long time, but they come in these nice little caskets. Just keep them in their casket; they're nice and safe there. Yeah, most quality mics have a decent case or a box or at least a satchel or bag that they come in. Um, if the bag is in, if it's in a literally airtight plastic bag, then yeah, you probably should put something in there to make sure there's no condensation on the capsule. But you're not going to ever dry out a mic too much unless you put it in the oven for <laughs> three, 300 <laughs> which, degrees which for four hours. we would not recommend unless you're <laughs> making brownies with it. Yeah. All right, you get, Thanks for that. Yeah, you get Jeff Holman's question. All righty. Hey, Jeff. Uh, hey, Mr. Source Connect. He says, what did, you, what did they say when you told them you couldn't log on with your new MacBook M1 Air? Did you get a workaround yet? If I had my ports mapped or Source Connect on my old MacBook Pro, would I need to get them remapped for my new M1 MacBook Air when it comes? Two-part question, not related to two things, but the first part was logging in. So I'm doing some early tests with the M1 MacBook Air and the version of Source Connect I'm demoing for this purpose for whatever reason, because this is what they sent me is Source Connect Pro. And I was not able to log into my account. They gave me a test account and the test account would log in. So there are definitely some little quirks and I, I, I still don't know if it's Big Sur that's the problem or if it's Silicon that's the problem. You know, meaning that is it something that happens when Rosetta does its little translation, so it'll run on the silicon machine? I don't know. And that's the thing. It's where it's early days, lots of testing to be done, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but yeah, not a workaround yet. Um, I'm sure I will find out one from Rebecca, the developer, head developer, the owner of Source Elements, hopefully pretty soon. Now, the port map thing is um, only if your new MacBook Air, your new MacBook has a different IP address, which it probably would. If you have two computers running on your network, they're going to have different IP addresses. And when they do, you need to have your ports remapped for the new IP address. So, yes, they will need to be remapped. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Oof. Yeah, people don't understand this port mapping thing. It's essentially you've got a lot of gateways to get to the actual Internet. Yeah. And they all have to line up just right. So, you know. yeah, you want to make sure that that will ensure the router doesn't see the, this, the audio stream coming in from the other guy, the other studio, as malicious. Right. That's what the port mapping is about. Because if the router doesn't like that signal, that data, it will just cut it off and you won't get a receive. And that's why map, port mapping ensures that won't happen. Yeah. Now, here's an, speaking of Source Connect, here's a question from Noreen Reardon. She says, absolutely love your weekly show, and 99% of what I have learned in the past eight months has been because of you guys. Aww, wow. Thank you. I hope that's good. It is. That is a good <laughs> But here's a question. Got a new, in September, MacBook Pro, and still have my old MacBook, which is working just fine, because they you plug them in and they work. Uh, should I buy an iLock key so I can use Source Connect? I pay monthly for standard on both Macs. Right now, the iLock license is only on my old Mac. I emailed iLock but have not received an answer because they're iLock. I have, Nobody's home. Yeah, I have not had to use Source Connect for the jobs that I, that I have been fortunate to get, but I want to be prepared if and when I do need it. Thank you. Well, I mean, it's logical to ask iLock that question, but they are not known for support. Who is known for support is Source Elements, though, and they would be able to answer that question. But I'll tell you right now, yes, that's exactly the use case for having the USB iLock key. It's having more than one computer, but only one license, and being able to move it back and forth. So that's precisely what the iLock key is for. So yes, I'll keep it sweet and short and sweet. There's Dan's my, got one right there. My iLock key right here. This thing is I got one too. 12 years old. And it one? still works. So Dan's got the OG original old school plastic one. And I have here an actual key. the iLock 3, the latest version of it. Yeah. Right here. Yeah, this one has a hard drive in it and all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> it looks exactly like a USB flash drive, except it costs... 40 plus dollars and it says iLock on it. 
Mm-hmm. So anyway. All right. Good question. Yes. Uh, from J. Horace Black. With the larger space, are you finding, this is in dealing with Lori Allen's thing, uh, with the larger space, are you finding that you need to put more treatment on the ceiling or other areas? Oh, yeah. For Lori Allen's booth that we heard samples for earlier, um, I probably will need to put some more treatment on the ceiling. So what I did was I put two smaller panels on an angle between the ceiling and the wall for various reasons. It was actually easier to install it that way at the time. And it looked cool. And it sort of serves as a base trap. So for several reasons, I did that. But that, that there's still a big chunk of ceiling that's still completely untreated. Um, so I might add another panel up there. Um, but also yeah, the watch. panels, yeah. And the panels on the side walls, none of them are that thick. They're all pretty thin because the old space was really tiny. So, you know, I might add something thicker and add some more layers or density to control that. But that's a, yeah, it's... Again, we're we're trying to get away with fewer panels than really would I would normally spec for a room that size, and that's the result. You get a little bit of resonance or a little bit of hollowness that can some, if, especially if you get too far from the mic. Right. So, distance to the mic is very very important. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a lot of questions, and we answered them all, and we all answered and we answered them all correctly. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. If you've got a question for us, email it to us at theguys at V-O-B-S dot TV. There it is. Right there. V-O-B-S dot TV, the guys. And uh, we will answer that question. We're still getting some questions in, but we're unfortunately out of time. But we will answer those questions via email. Thank you for sending those in. And uh, maybe we'll cover them in the new year when... Life will be beautiful and the sun will be, well, the sun's always shining here, but, uh, so anyway, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back to wrap things up for 2020 right after this. Hello. Hello. Welcome to voiceover body shop. It's a place where you can get your body shopped with voices. Come on. Look at Dan's head. So shiny. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? Stick around. You don't want to miss this. Look what you made me do. Power 103.9. At Target, we want you to come as you are. Be comfortable. Uh, okay, maybe not bathrobe comfortable. Pants for the customer in aisle four, please. Nuevo México necesita un cambio. La representante Michelle Lujan Grisham ha luchado por nuestro estado en la Cámara de Representantes. Watch anywhere, anytime on an unlimited number of devices. Sign in with your Netflix account to watch instantly at Netflix.com. The ice cream maker is a big risk that can have huge reward until you forget to turn it on. Well, that's it, guys. Time is up. Hey, it's JMC. Thanks for watching the voiceover body shop. If you're demo ready or looking to get there, check out jmcdemos.com and see a sample of our work. Now let's get back to Dan and George and this week's tech wisdom. Yeah. Hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching voiceover body shop. Yep. It's time for gift giving for the VO person in your life. And that's probably you. And right now at voiceoveressentials.com, you can get the 20-color LED VO recording sign. It's flying off the shelf. Seriously, it's the holiday present of 2020 from VOE. Now, this multicolor LED sign is perfect for alerting your household that you're recording and to keep it down. It comes with a remote that can control the colors of your secret codes. Get it now at voiceoveressentials.com. And the top stocking stuffer this year? It's the ABS, the adjustable boom stop. No more droopy mics. Works with a tripod or solid round base. It's three ounces of protection for your expensive microphone. Get them now at voiceoveressentials.com. That's voiceoveressentials.com. Thanks, Harlan. You're watching VOBS.TV. I don't know why. It's crazy what they do here. I think I'm going to go somewhere else and have a cheese sandwich. I still don't get the cheese sandwich thing, but 
whatever. That's improv, folks. That's improv <laughs> acting. Thank you. Anyway, uh, so we're going to take some time off now, but we'll put on a really good show from 2020 uh, on next week for the next couple of weeks. And we want to wish you guys Merry Christmas and Merry and Happy New Year. Anything's better than this year. Um, and uh, stay, stay, stay safe, stay, stay, stay safe. smart. Wear a mask. Um, you, know, hands, you know, this is a real test of what I would call adulting. Mm-hmm. where we do really difficult stuff, which is not go see people we love, not travel uh, with family or hang out with friends that, you know, we think are all safe, but <laughs> oftentimes aren't really. Um, just be really smart about it. I canceled travel to see my folks this year for Christmas. It's my daughter and my girlfriend. We were gonna, my girlfriend was going to get to see Philadelphia. It was such a cool place to go, especially with the election and not happening. And uh, that's what we got to do. Um, so get your Zoom on with your family. Have fun. Find ways to have fun with your with the people close to you that you live with. And, you know, just play it safe, folks, please. Absolutely. You know, until they sound the all clear, you know, get vaccinated. Anyway, who are our donors of the week? We got those names you've heard before. We got Martha Kahn, Don Griffith, Stephen Chandler. Noreen Reardon, Michael Kearns, Christy Burns, Graham Spicer, Antland Productions, Michelle Blanker, Mike Gordon, and Dwayne DeSalvo. A lot of familiar names there and a couple new ones. Yeah. And if you go to our website, it says there's a button there. It says donate now. We'd love to have you uh, help contribute to make this show a success, which is why we can bring you fresh content almost every week that's relevant to your voiceover business and your career and your technology and your performance and all those things. Um, what are we going to do in 2021? Cover all the stuff that's going to happen in 2021, I guess. Uh, another year, another year of home studios. And, um, you know, if you guys have interested, if you guys have topics you want to have us cover, if you have guests that you'd like to see, we definitely would love your input. You know, we've been doing this show come March. It'll be 11 years. We definitely can use fresh input. <laughs> I can tell you, I'm speaking from myself and probably Dan, you know, because we love to make sure we're covering people that you guys want to hear from. And so let us know. Absolutely. The email address is on the screen, but if you're listening, it's the guys at vobs.tv. All righty. Well, we need to thank our sponsors again for another fine year of support of our, our, our little our little TV show here and podcast. Uh, Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VOHeroes.com. VoiceActorWebsites.com. And JMC Demos. All righty. Our thanks. What a great year. Uh, we added Jeff Holman to our staff working the uh, the social media stuff. Thanks to him. B.S. Speaking of Jeff Holman. Speaking of Jeff Holman. Uh, and our amazing technical director who's having a day, but she's getting it done no matter what. She pushes through and it makes it happen. Sue Merlino. Hire her if you... If, if, OMG. Yeah. If you have a task that has anything to do with podcasting, live streaming, television production... She's I mean, she's so multifaceted and a real pro, and he's so nice to work with. Just not on Monday night. <laughs> exactly. Not for these four hours. <laughs> and, of course, our thanks to Lee Penny for continuing to just be Lee Penny. Well, that's going to do it for us tonight and for 2020. Uh, remember, if it sounds good. It, it is good. It is good. All righty. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. B B S Tech Talk Tech Talk Tech Talk Tech Talk Have a good 2021 guys Good night everybody